that, that doesn't work with me. I don't, I don't take hints very well. So uh, I think my wife would say I'm pretty oblivious. So it causes it to vibrate with the same frequency and therefore creates those compression waves that we were talking about before uh, and it creates sound. Uh, you can actually do this with a coil of what is called magnet wire, a magnet and a shoebox. And you could actually hook this up like speaker wire, like via speaker wire to speaker, and you can make a uh, you can make a working speaker like it. It's not going to be very good, but you can uh, just with a shoebox, glue a magnet to the back to it, put a coil of wires right near it, and have it push and pull it, and it will vibrate it a little bit. And you cannot it's not going to be very loud. If you turn it up very loud, it'll probably melt the coil of wires and stuff. But there's a lot more to it than that. But you can make like a rudimentary speak <clears throat> speaker. Okay, so what we're doing then in this chapter, we're going to look at induced electromotive force. So what's electromotive force? Yeah, it's a, well, it's not just on a battery. It's a supplied voltage. It's like a, it's a voltage source. And it has that unfortunate name, electromotive force, the EMF, with the force in there, even though it's not a force. Uh, we're going to look at magnetic flux. We already talked about electric flux, so this shouldn't be too big of a deal to do. It'll just be magnetically. Uh, we're going to look at Faraday's law of induction. So this will tell us essentially how much um, EMF we can get in an induced current by inducing a current. Uh, we'll look at Lenz's law that tells us what direction essentially the current is going in and, and, and a few other little things. Uh, we'll look at the energy uh, mechanical and electrical that we get out of this, how generators and motors work. We'll look at inductance and then resistant inductor circuits. Inductors are basically a coil of wires that you send electricity to. They act pretty much the opposite of capacitors. Okay, they do, uh, they can perform a lot of the same functions, like something that you would put a capacitor in parallel for, an inductor will do in series. Uh, which is, you know, they, they, they're kind of just mirror image of each other a little. You'll, you'll see when we get there. Uh, we'll look at energy stored in magnetic fields. There better be. Otherwise, you know, those solar sails and stuff like that are not going to work because there has to actually be momentum in these fields. And then transformers, which is how, you know, you can get electricity, part, well, electricity going in your house. So anyway, let's take a look here. Uh, this actually is a basic transformer right there in the picture. You have your primary circuit and your secondary circuit. So basically in this experiment, you run electricity through one circuit and you have a coil of wires in it. That coil of wires creates a magnetic field. Here, that magnetic field is transferred through this bar that is there. It magnetizes that bar. You can just put the coils near each other. And then what that does is creates a magnetic field that is inside that secondary coil, the secondary circuit, and therefore creates current in the secondary circuit. This only works while the current is varying because changing magnetic fields will induce electricity. Static ones do not. A static unchanging magnetic field is not gonna produce current for you. It has to be a changing magnetic field because magnetic fields themselves do no work. Changing magnetic fields induce electric fields which can then do work and create current for us. So we need changing magnetic fields, okay? Has to be while it's changing. This is why we have alternating currents in our house households, the way it's made. All right, the current in the secondary circuit is zero as long as the current in the primary circuit is not changing. That means the magnetization of the iron bar is not changing. And so we have a static magnetic field. Current flows in the secondary circuit while the current in the primary is changing. Okay, it flows in the opposite directions depending on whether the magnetic field is increasing or decreasing. And we'll talk about that. That's, that'll be part of Lenz's law. And then the magnitude of the induced current is proportional to the rate at which the magnetic field is changing. How quickly you're changing it will determine uh, how much of an induced EMF you'll get and how much of an induced current you will get. Okay. So, so far, there's not a lot to understand. I've just been telling it to you as we, as we move forward here. 
we'll explain why these things happen. All right. So taking a look here, I know it says here, uh, note the motion of the magnet in each image. I'm not sure what that motion is supposed to be indicating there. I, I guess I'm assuming those are like speed lines behind it and they're moving it to the right. The basic idea here is you move a magnet like toward, toward a coil of wires. It increases the magnetic field inside that coil of wires and therefore induces a current. So in the last chapter, we talked about how putting a current through a coil of wires made a magnetic field. Here, we're just doing the same thing kind of reverse. We're using a magnetic field to generate a current in the coil. All right, and the same thing here, if you then take it away, it'll, uh, it'll create a current going in the other way. And then of course, if you leave it just sitting there stationary next to it, as in this bottom picture, nothing will happen. You get no current, all right? So uh, this is kind of like some of those, like if you ever had one of those flashlights that you shake and then it works, you're shaking it. There's a little magnet in there that's moving back and forth through a coil of wires. And if you've ever seen one of those, they usually make them clear so you can see the magnet going. And there's a coil of wires in the middle and you're shaking it and it's going through the coil of wires and it's doing this, creating that electricity, storing it in like a capacitor. And then you turn the flashlight on and it turns on. All right. But it's not the magnetic field doing the work, it's you shaking it that's doing the work. Uh, here, we can talk about magnetic flux, very similar to uh, electric flux in that we're looking at the amount of magnetic field lines going through an area. So we again have that BA cosine theta where theta is the angle between the magnetic field and the normal to our surface. Uh, here we have an SI unit of what is called a Weber. All right, a Weber, a Tesla meter squared. All right, that's just flux times area. This is very important for calculating how much EMF is going to be induced. Okay, so flux pretty much the same as it was before. As we rotate this to be perpendicular to the magnetic field, then the magnetic field just goes down the sides of it, and you end up with the cosine of 90, which is zero. If you rotate it such that that angle is zero, then it's like holding our hula hoop where the, all the water rushes through it, right? So that our surface is like perpendicular to the magnetic field. So it's cosine of zero, and therefore we're at a maximum where cosine is then one. But it's the same thing, strength of the field times the area. Last time it was E times A, this time it's B times A. Uh, Faraday's law basically tells us that the EMF produced is equal to essentially the rate of change of the flux or the negative rate of change of the flux. And I will explain that negative in just a few minutes here. So an EMF is induced only when the magnetic flux through a loop changes with time. All right, how many different ways can you think of to change the magnetic flux through a loop? Can anybody think of any ways we could do that? Change the angle. There's one. What else could we do? Move the magnet. That was one we just did, right? Move the magnet. What else could we do? What's that? Yeah, you could spin the magnet. That'll do it. What else could you do? So we've, the strength of the magnetic field, we can change that by moving the magnet, either moving it linearly or rotationally. We can change the angle. You can change the area. In fact, I think I even mentioned this before that there are medical devices that work on this, like that monitor whether or not someone is still breathing. And they do this just based off Earth's magnetic field, right? As you breathe, it expands your chest and would expand the area of that and therefore change the flux. And you can read that as a change in voltage. So you can change the area. 
You can change the number of turns, right? Two turns will have twice the flux as one turn. Anything else you could do? Last little thing in there. How about just flat out vary the magnetic field, right? If you just turn on or off the magnetic field, you can do that as well. That's how our, um, that's how the, the back here, our uh, first little look at a, a, a transformer there works, varies the magnetic field, okay? So just a few different ways. All of those different things that you would do is while it is varying, will create an EMF like this, okay? Uh, in fact, one of the proposed ways to power a space station is to essentially have your space station like way up here or your satellite, and then have a long tether that goes in a loop, right? So this would be like your circuit to another thing down here. And then this would be a, a loop, a long loop of, of wire. And then as you orbit the planet, you're gonna be going through changing magnetic fields, right? As you get further north and south and all that kind of stuff. You know, if you ever look at satellites, they, they do like a sine wave as they go around. You know, they don't just go straight around normally because Earth's tilted and they're going at a different angle. So they're going through different magnetic fields. And the idea here is that as your space station goes around, it's going to generate electricity by that flux changing through the magnetic field uh, as, it, as it just orbits, right? Like free energy right there, isn't it? But aren't we supposed to not be able to get free energy? See if as we go along through this section, if you can figure out where the problem with that is. It will generate electricity, but it isn't for free. Okay, you gotta tell me what the cost is. Okay, so this is just number of turns, times the change, the rate of change of the flux. Negative number of turns times the rate of change of the flux, the number of turns in your coil. All right. Uh, here, you can see a lot of different devices. Look at this, like an electric guitar. As that string that is slightly magnetized vibrates, it's going to induce uh, a changing magnetic field that is put through a pickup, which is just a coil of wires, essentially and creates then a signal according to the frequency at which it is vibrating. You know, change the length of the string, you change the frequency with it vibrates, you change the frequency with which it's generating, uh, it's generating that changing flux and therefore it changes the frequency of the signal that's generated, okay? Uh, same thing here, old tape recorders, tape decks, VHS tapes, things like that. Uh, they were magnetic strips. And as that magnetic strip was fed through, uh, a pattern would be created. It would just be done near a coil of wires like this that would create a changing magnetic flux of that coil of wires that could be read as an electrical signal. Uh, but those were just magnetized, you know, electrical tapes that just uh, uh, would be just be in a certain pattern that could be read as like zeros and ones and everything and, and create, or, or according to its frequency and pattern could be used to create um, you know, uh, uh, the same crazy signal of magnification. So it depends whether or not you're using it for like data storage or music storage, I guess, as to whether or not it's going to be zeros and ones versus that other stuff. Okay. Uh, let's go. We'll come back to these at the end. How about that? So let's take a look at this. This is Lenz's law. Basically, this law states that nature hates or abhors a change in flux. Anytime you go to change flux, nature tries to stop that change. It tries to do the opposite. If you add flux in, it tries to create flux in the opposite direction to cancel it out. If you take flux away, it tries to add flux in to make up for what you removed. That's what it does. So when you look at a situation, you have to figure out uh, what will happen in order for it to do the opposite, which is why we get that negative on that last equation. So an induced current always flows in a direction that opposes the change that causes it. 
All right. Therefore, if the magnetic field is increasing, the magnetic field created by the induced current will be in the opposite direction of decrease. Now, in the opposite direction. If decreasing, it will be in the same direction. So we'll, we'll, we'll work some more on this. But if it wasn't this way, if nature didn't do this, then we would get free energy. All right. You would be able to then just start something moving and then in a magnetic field and then the magnetic field would create a magnetic field that moved it more and more and more and more and make it go faster and faster and faster and faster and you'd get all kinds of free energy out of that but that doesn't happen uh essentially if you try to like move a coil of wires near a magnetic field it will try to stop that motion from happening this is how uh brakes on like a lot of roller coasters and magnetic braking works they apply a changing magnetic field and it induces these little eddy currents that will then be in the opposite direction and slow it down. In the lab, I'll show you a demonstration of this, okay? When we get in there before we start the, uh, the lab, just remind me to if I don't start to do it, okay? It's actually one of the neatest like little demonstrations. It's very, very short, I guess. It's very simple, but it's very neat. Very impressive. So, uh, <clears throat> Here, you can take this conducting rod, it completes the circuit. As it falls, the magnetic flux decreases. So in other words, we're moving this rod this way and it will induce a current. It induces this current, which I believe is on the next page here, because as we go down, it hates that change in flux and therefore a current is produced that will try to add that flux back in. So if the bar was up here and we had these extra flux lines right there, then we would move it down here. This amount of flux now is removed from our loop. Therefore, this will produce a current. Look at the direction the current is going. If I wrap my fingers around the loop in that direction, my thumb is pointed out towards you, it adds back in some of that magnetic flux that was lost. Notice I said it adds some of it back in. Why doesn't it add all of it back in? Any guesses? Why wouldn't it add all the magnetic flux back in? There you go. Resistance. It's lost to heat, essentially. The, the, the current moving in that wire encounters resistance and therefore it loses that energy. Have, if we had something that had no resistance in it, like, I don't know, a superconductor, especially one that was room temperature, then uh, we'd get a much, we'd, we'd get a lot more current from doing this with a, with a superconductor, okay? We wouldn't have those, those heat losses and it would be a lot more efficient, okay? So just by moving that. Now, if we took that bar and we moved it away, and actually also you should notice on here, look, we have that force right there. Take a look at the force. It's pointed in the opposite direction of the bar is being moved, right? Currents going to the left. Point your fingers in the direction of the current. Curl your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, which is out of the board, and look which way my thumb's pointed. The opposite direction are moving. Now, what if you grab this and you tried to pull it? Back the way, so you pushed it in, and now you're going to try and pull it back up. As you pull it back up, right? So if we change this, if we change this to moving up, what's going to happen? Well, one, we're going to get a force pointed in the other direction, right? Because now, uh, because now we should get current flowing in the other direction, right? But why would we get current flowing in the other direction? So as we move this bar up, this bit of flux is not inside the loop, correct? If I move the bar up to here, that magnetic flux now is inside the loop, right? Pretending these wires continue on up. Okay. So if I add flux in, what does nature want to do? 
wants to cancel it out, right? So if I add a vector pointed out, how do I cancel it out? With a vector pointed in, right? And so therefore, it's going to want to create a flux such that it creates a magnetic field pointed in, right? It's going to create a magnetic field pointed in, and then look which way my fingers wrap. They wrap in the other direction. It would create a current going in the other direction, which would create a force in the other direction. So no matter which way I push or pull that, I get a force that opposes that pushing and pulling. That's where if you were doing this and there was no force opposing you pushing it, that's, that's free energy, right? Because you're doing work against that force that's getting trans, it's getting, uh, uh, it's getting whatever, changed, transferred into, translated into, it's getting changed into electrical work. Right, we're getting electrical energy by applying that force. So it's still not the magnetic field doing the work. It's still you or whatever it is that's pushing and pulling that magnet. Think about this a little bit. There is a way you could use this, run electricity through that circuit and create a rail gun. This is the basis for it. Anybody ever heard of a rail gun? Rail, R-A-I-L gun. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's what this is. If you use a magnetic field and you run electricity through it, this would be the projectile in this case. And these would be the rails that it would go down. So rail, rail, you run electricity through it and it creates a flux and then it creates this force and will push it out. If you, of course, if you run the current the wrong way, it's going to fire it back at you. But if you do it the right way, it should go the right way for you. Okay. Any questions on that? Nothing so far? More about Linz's Law. These are the eddy currents I was talking about where you can just do this. Uh, there's an old like classic experiment for this where you have this, these two magnets that are kind of like facing each other, right? Like this, I don't know, something like that, okay? And then you have this pendulum that's metallic and it will swing down between them, all right? And it, it's, like a, it's like a disc. This pendulum is like a, this disc that fits right in between the, these north and south pole of a magnet, north and this one south. So you have this really strong magnetic field through there. And so as this swings down through that little tiny gap and tries to fit through, it just comes to a stop because of these eddy currents. Right? It produces small little currents around inside the material that oppose that motion and create an opposite magnetic field, and it suddenly stops it. But then they take and they, they'll swap out that disc, and they put a disc in that has a bunch of slits cut in it, like that. Lots of little slits cut in it. And when you do that, suddenly it doesn't stop it, and it swings through because those slits – it's like if I took here, like, and I have this little eddy current that's, you know what I mean? Like this little eddy current that's flowing around. If I cut a notch out of this, suddenly that, that current can't flow because I've, I've separated the two sides. And so you don't get nearly as much eddy currents and it won't stop it. All right, so old classic little experiment. You can probably find one of those on YouTube to watch. Um, but anyway, pretty neat. All right, so here we're going to look at what do we need to calculate uh, induced EMFs when we do this. Uh, you can see we've got a magnetic field uh, pointed out of this screen. We are moving that bar outward, so we are therefore increasing flux. The amount by which we increase flux is going to be based on the amount of this area right here that gets added. The Width of that area or the height of it is L. It's the separation between the two sides of like whatever our, our wires are. And then times this width here, whatever that is. So length times width kind of a thing. Well, that width is just velocity times time, right? Because velocity equals distance over time. And so the distance that bar travels is velocity times time. And the distance it travels is the width. So those two things multiplied together, V delta T, is going to tell us that new change in area. 
And so then we can figure out how much the flux change was and therefore uh, how much of an EMF is induced. So if we look here, we can see the change in flux, just as I was saying, is B times delta A, because we're changing the area, not the strength of the magnetic field. And so it's just B, V, L, delta T, because V times delta T is the width. And so our induced EMF, the magnitude of it is epsilon equals N times that change in flux, which is B, V, L, del delta T over delta T. So those will cancel. We only have one turn. And so it's just B times V times L. Your choices are write down B times V times L or memorize it or understand what I just went through and be able to derive that. Go through a similar thought process to come up with it. Look at how much flux is added and taken away based on how much area is changed there. Uh, the electric field then that is caused by this is B times V. All right, I think, what are we on? What page is this, 18? I think I'm gonna go over to example problems now. Let's try a couple of these. So let's consider a circular loop with a 2.5 centimeter radius in a constant magnetic field of 0.625 Tesla. Find the magnetic flux through this loop when it's normal makes an angle of zero degrees, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, and 90 degrees with the direction of the magnetic field. So what was our equation for magnetic flux? B A cosine theta, good. Cosine is the, or I'm sorry, theta is the angle between the normal to the plane of our loop and the magnetic field, which is exactly what they're giving us, right? It's the flux through, uh, magnetic flux through this loop when it's normal makes those angles. So the normal to the loop is making those angles. So those are all of our different thetas. We don't have an area there. We instead have a radius. So we can make a change here and make this B instead of A, it's pi r squared. So B pi r squared cosine theta. So if we look at part A, we want theta equals zero degrees. And so we would do B, so flux, is going to equal <coughs> B, where is it? 0.625 Tesla times pi times 2.5 times 10 to the negative 2 meters squared times the cosine of 0 degrees. Cosine of 0 degrees is what? What? One, all right, 2.5 squared, two and a half, two and a half, right? So two, two and a half is five. So what is that, 6.25 and then a half of two and a half? So this is gonna be, this, this we can say is 6.25 times 10 to the negative one Tesla times our pi times 6.25 times 10 to the negative fourth. So we end up with six times six. So maybe that's like, you know, 36 to 38 ish or something like that times three, 3.14. So if we did like 40 times three, we should get like 120 times 10 to the negative fifth. So this is like 120 ish times 10 to the negative fifth. And then Weber's, which is what? 1.2 uh, times 10 to the negative three, something like that. Anybody want to do that exactly for us? I'm trying to do my estimation in your head real quick there. To... 1.6 times 10 to the negative three. There we go. So 1.3. Cool. 
Cool. And then let's do B. What do we have to change for B? Just the angle, right? Here, theta equals 30 degrees. And so we come across here, we're gonna do the exact same thing. So that was our answer for A. Maybe move this down slightly. So this will be flux equals, and we'll have, we'll have all of this except this cosine won't be of zero, it'll be of, oops, 30 degrees, just like that. Okay, what is the cosine of 30? Wow, do you really remember the decimal of that? Oh, I, I was like, wow, I know it is square root of three over two, but, I was, you had that so fast. <laughs> All right. So anyway, it's going to be our exact same answer as before, right? All of this is going to be equaling 1.3 times 10 to the negative third Weber. But now, you see what I'm saying here? That's all 1.3 times 10 to the negative third Weber times the cosine of 30, right? Which is square root of three over two. So 1.3 divided by two is about what? 0.65. And then square root of three is one point something. So maybe 0.7-ish, 0.7, 0 0.8, something like that. What does it turn out to be? We just need 1.3 times square root of 3 over 2. What's square root of 3 over 2? What did you tell us? 0.6 or something? Didn't you say that? 0.8? Point, point what? What is square root of 3? Is it closer to 2 than I was thinking? I was thinking like, I was guesstimating like a lower one point something. So, okay, all right. What does it turn out to be then? One point, what? One, two. Yep. Whew. My guesstimation wasn't going very well that time. was off by like 0.3. Anyway, you can do the other two. You just need to swap out that cosine. The next one you do cosine of 60, which would be half. So that would be 0.65 times 10 to the negative third. And then at 90 degrees, what would the answer be? Zero. So if you wanted to do part C, it would just be theta equals 60 degrees. And so this would be flux equals 1.3 times 10, 1.3 times 10 to the negative third Weber times one half. And so this would be uh, 6.5 times 10 to the negative four Weber. And then of course for D, theta equals zero degrees. And so this would just be, you know, the whole thing times zero, 1.3 times 10 to the negative three Weber times zero. Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah, maybe go back to that one day where y'all asked me lots of questions. That was fun. No. Okay. So a bar magnet is moved rapidly toward a 40 turn circular coil of wire. As the magnet moves, the average value of B 
B cosine theta over the area of the coil increases from 0.125 Tesla to 0.450 Tesla in 0.25 seconds. If the radius of the coil is 3.05 centimeters and the resistance of the wire is 3.55 ohms, find the magnitude of A, the induced EMF, and the induced current. So what are we given here? We're given B cosine theta, or delta B cosine theta, is going to be 0 0.0125 Tesla minus, sorry, it's that's the second one, 0 0.450 Tesla minus 0 0.0125 Tesla. They tell us delta T, which is always just I don't like writing delta T every time because time is always delta T, uh, is 0 0.250 seconds. They tell us N equals 40. Uh, they tell us the radius is 3.05 centimeters, which is 3.05 times 10 to the negative 2 meters. And then they tell us the resistance of the wire is 3.55 ohms, just like that. And they want us to first find out the induced EMF. So induced EMF, who remembers? What does it equal? Well, that's not remembering, that's looking. Rate of change of flux, right? Just like that. Our flux, remember, uh, oops, our flux is B A cosine theta, which in this case is B pi R squared cosine theta, right? We already have B cosine theta, what it changes. So this will become negative N times, uh, the pi R squared isn't gonna be a part of it. So let me put it this way, delta, delta phi then is A times delta B cosine theta, like that. It's delta B cosine theta. That's our change in B cosine theta. So we don't necessarily know if that's all entirely due to the magnet being moved rapidly or if it's just the coil is also spinning at the same time. I don't know. I don't care. I just know that that's how much this is going to change. And so this will be pi r squared delta b cosine theta. And so this becomes negative in pi r squared delta b cosine theta over t, delta t. Just our time. Okay, and I think we have all of these numbers, right? So we should be able to start plugging in. So this is part A. So our average induced EMF is negative 40. Uh, negative 40 times pi times 3.05 times 10 to the negative 2 meters squared times 0 0.450 minus 0 0.0125 Tesla over T, which is 0.25 seconds, which is the same thing as just multiplying by four, right? So 40 times four would be 160. And then we have, what is 0.45 minus 0 0.0125? So whatever that is, 0.43-ish, 0.4 something. So we have about a 0.4 times a 0.3, that times three, or no, times nine, right? Because we have to square that. So three, that gives us, three times 10 to the negative four times another pi, that's nine times 10 to the negative four and then nine times 160. 
is what? What's nine times one and a half? About 14. And this times 160 instead. So it's 14. With, so 1,400 times 10 to the negative four. Is that right? So that would just be 14. Is that right? Am I anywhere close? <laughs> Somewhere in there? It's good to try that stuff. And then you want to see if your two answers are kind of matching. Anybody gotten an answer? Really? You sure about it? Anybody else? Really? And y'all squared that? Man, I'm way off. How am I so far off? Dividing by 0.25 is the same thing as multiplying, right? So this should be 160. This should be about a nine times 10 to the negative fourth. No, I didn't. I did, I did, I did it later. And then this is about 0.4-ish, 0.4. So 0.4, what did I do there? So that's, let's do three times four, that's 1.2 times that, so 1.1, I don't know, times 10 to the negative four, maybe it is. What did I do there? I, I got something totally different on that top part. When I did 0.4 times nine, what did I do? How did I get like, because I remember multiplying something by nine and saying 14. What did I multiply by nine? I don't know. Yeah, why did I do that? Oh, because I did 0.4 times three, maybe? Which is, a, I thought about one and a half, one and a half. Yeah, yeah. But still, that shouldn't have made me off by three orders of magnitude. I'm not sure where. So this is, this is, one, this is nine. So this is still 10 to the negative fourth. 10 to the, but then, yeah, yeah, it should be that small. I don't know. I messed up somewhere. Thanks. I'll stop embarrassing myself for the rest of class here. What was it again? It's 205 what? Good. Should be a volt. And then... Uh, and then part B, the induced current. Who am I kidding? I'll probably try one more time here. The induced current is going to be from V equals I R, I equals V over R, which is epsilon over R, which is the 0 0.205 uh, over the resistance, which was 3.55. What is that? 0 0.06? Yeah, I'm back in the game. So about 0 0.06 amps-ish. Huh? Ish. Ish. Two out of three ain't bad. All right, there you go, guys. Uh, tomorrow we'll finish up this chapter and uh, do some more of these with whatever time we have left and then I'll finish the rest of them for you outside of class to look at, okay? Have a great day, good seeing y'all again. Bye. Be good.